Take your Bible out, turn to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to finish up chapter 3 this morning. We've been walking verse by verse through Galatians. And, um, and I want to set the, 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 uh, the stage for this message uh, with this. Has anybody ever seen the movie Yes Day? Anybody? Okay, I'm seeing some hands. What about Liar Liar? Anybody ever seen? Okay, more hands, right? Liar, liar. The gym, y'all should be ashamed of yourself. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, but, 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 you know, some of those movies, and I, and I try to brainstorm some more uh, movies, uh, but, uh, but we'll just stick with those two. Yes Day is essentially this family that's so scattered, they're so, the kids are kind of, they're losing touch with their kids and all of those things, and they get the suggestion to do a Yes Day, where Everything is planned by the kids and the parents have to say yes. So they eat ice cream for breakfast, right? They go to the local ice cream place for breakfast. They, they, um, they have like a paint war or something like that. I'm not sure that's a thing. But anyway, that's in the movie, right? And, 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 and so the parents have to say yes all day. And it's like a kid's dream, is it not? I mean, some of you teenagers, this means yes. It's like a kid's dream. Everything you ask of your parent that day, they have to say yes, But you know what happens? Chaos. Right? Chaos. What happens in the movie Liar Liar when when Jim Carrey is not able to uh, do his job as an attorney, right? And there's there's some real moral issues with even bringing that up, that this would be okay and all of those things with the in a sermon, but just just follow me here, right? Right? That when that when when Jim Carrey chaos erupts in his life, right? And, and things just go crazy. He, you know, loses his partnership at his law firm and all those different things because he's not able to, uh, to lie like he normally does in his, in his job. Um, you know, and, it, and it's, 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 it's amazing when you think about people that win the lottery, right? If they don't put structure around their winnings, right, they end up bankrupt. They end up, you know, right back worse off even than, than they were because they get that whole chunk of money and they go off and they spend it carelessly and they do all these things and they buy their, their pastor a new, a new, you know, car and, and, and all of those things, right? Um, <coughs> uh, season tickets to the Fenway, right? All these, you know, they just, you know, for their pastor, Right and and um, and and it just ends up in chaos. Okay, such is Christianity without the law. So we've been talking about we've been talking about the book of Galatians, and we've been talking about how Paul's writing to this church at Galatia because they're getting consumed. Right, they're they're losing sight of Jesus. Right. And, and there's these Judaizers that are coming in, these false teachers, and they're trying to get them to buy back into the Old Testament law that Jesus died to fulfill, right? But, but, the, but the thing that we've got to get to today and what Paul brings around full circle is that it's not that the law is bad. There's structure within the law. We're going to talk about that. It's not that the law is bad. It's just not complete in and of itself, without Jesus, right? It's not complete in and of itself. When I ask my kids to clean their room, there's two responses that I get, one way more often than the other. Now, the one response I get way more often than the other is the child turns around and stomps all the way back to their room to clean their room. Does that make my heart happy? Come on, dads. Does that make my heart happy? Moms. No. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Uh, <laughs> Dave's behind the curtain back there making sure the words come up on the screen and he was the loudest. No. Right? <laughs> no, it doesn't make my heart happy. Right? The second response that has maybe happened once since I've been a dad for 13 and a half years, you got it, dad. I'm on my way. Right? And when it comes to the law, we can approach the law one of two ways. We can stomp, we can throw a temper tantrum, right? Or we can say, thank you, Jesus, for the structure to keep my heart safe, my mind clear, and my body healthy, right? And so what I want to talk to you about today, really from Paul's words to the church at Galatia, is what's the motivation of the heart? 
And I want to do that by asking three common questions of the law. Our teenagers on Sunday nights are walking through the book of Galatians. They've been having a lot of conversation about, well, well, well then, then, then we're all free. Everything's fair game. And, and we're going to address some of that this morning. Look at verse 15. Look at verse 15 in, in Galatians chapter 3. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. And so Paul has essentially said, oh foolish Galatians, he's offended them, he's brought them, he's, he's, he's woken them up to what he's talking about and, and trying to get them to buy into the fact that when we live without boundaries, chaos erupts. Right? And so, and so verse 16, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It did not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God, so as to make the promise void. But if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Why then the law? Right? I love that. Verse 19, Paul says, why then the law? It was added because of transgressions. Until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. So pause, thinking about verse 19. Why then the law? Right? A couple of weeks ago, we, we, we shared some outrageous loss. Right? And, uh, and somebody, somebody, watched it, uh, somebody watched it online, and I was walking into basketball practice down in Saco this past week, and they said, I can't believe that you're not allowed to drive in Ma- Massachusetts with a gorilla in your back seat. <laughs> that makes no sense. And I'm like, I know, it's crazy, but it's against the law to drive in Massachusetts. In, c- in case y'all forgot, okay, and you're making a day trip down there, all right, don't keep your gorilla in the back seat. It's against the law, right? But where did that come from? Somebody had to either have the thought or actually drive on 495 in Massachusetts with a gorilla in the back seat and get caught. Right? And so Paul asked the question, why then the law? Because chaos had to be addressed. Because something had to be addressed. And because there was a gorilla lover that thought gorillas should never be placed in the back seat, front seat only. (laughs) That was on that state representative, right? I mean, I mean, let's think about this for a second. Why then the law? Because structure. Paul says because sin. There was laws put in place 430 years after, right? After the covenant with Abraham was made, the law appears, right? And so in that time, there were things that people were engaged in, that things, things that people were doing that were causing them to step away from God. Thus, the law. Okay, let's keep reading. Y'all got to stop interrupting me. Okay, is the, verse 21, is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. Everybody say, nope. Nope. Right? Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? No, certainly not. A compliment. Okay, let's see what Paul says. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the faith, until the coming faith would be revealed. Verse 24. So then... The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Law is the guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Now, we've got a lot of ground to cover this morning, but again, the way I want to set this up is I want to ask three common questions about the law, and let's look at what Paul has to, has to say to it from the text. You good? Everybody here? All right. Question number one, why do we even have the Old Testament law? 
Why the law, right? Why do we even have the Old Testament law? And let me, let me add kind of a, a, a 1B to this question. Why is it still relevant to us today? Right? Because that's the second question we get. And that's the question that, 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 that pastors and churches and denominations are, are kind of battling through currently. Right? Not only, I mean, I mean sure, it might have been useful. We might have needed it at the time. I mean, Paul even addresses it here. It was the guardian until Jesus, right? Until the fulfillment of the law came. But why is it still relevant to us today? Why do we still preach the law today? It's a great question. To, to answer it, we've got to take a step back. Okay? All of the Old Testament, okay, all of the OT, was pointing to the coming of the promised Messiah. Who was the promised Messiah? Good job. Good job. Awesome. You can never go wrong with Jesus in church, right? God made a promise to Abraham that he would make a mighty nation from his descendants. Okay, that he would give him so many children and grandchildren and great grandchildren that they would outnumber the sands of the sea. So by a, by faith, and we see this in Hebrews chapter eleven too in the Hall of Faith, that by faith Abraham believed God's promise. It was hard because God waited until Abraham was a hundred years old, Sarah was ninety before Isaac was born. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how hard it was to trust God in faith, to believe in faith? And God waited so long. Abraham was 100. Sarah was 90 before Isaac was born. And Paul points out here in chapter 3 that God's promise to Abraham was fulfilled. So think about this. The Ten Commandments didn't come for 430 years after God's graceful promise to Abraham. But the purpose of the law was the same to point people to Jesus. The purpose of the law, that's a good thing to write down right there. The purpose of the law is to point people to Jesus. The same as the covenant to Abraham to point people to Jesus. There were hundreds of other laws about what they could eat, what they couldn't eat, what they could touch, what they could not touch, how to conduct all the temple sacrifices, special holidays to to observe, all types of things, what to wear, what they could wear, what they couldn't wear, what they could wear at the same time as, you know, on other fabrics and different things like that. It was very detailed and God actually laid so many laws on them to let them see that no person could actually keep all the laws. Wait, so God was playing a game? If you see it that way, But think about this, right? In order, this is what we've been talking about with salvation and justification by faith, right? Being justified by faith to be declared righteous by God, right? Not by ourselves, right? The the whole goal, right, for us as people is to recognize and see our need for God, i.e. humility. We have to recognize Jesus' words in John 14, apart from me, you can do nothing. Right? And so God created, God's doing the same thing in the OT that Jesus is doing in the, in the NT. Right? In the Old Testament and New Testament. Right? He made so many laws, He made them so detailed, He made them so structured to show the people that without a, without a mediator, without a Savior, without someone that could fulfill the law, something drastic happening, you don't have a shot. Well, that's pretty depressing. So is our lives without Jesus. We are desperate without Christ. And so God created this in such a way to stir humility and desperation within people that they needed a Savior. That it was pointing to the need for a Savior. All the laws of the Old Testament were given to show that no person could be as holy as God. Without laws to break, they would have realized that they were sinners who needed forgiveness. And so, and so let's, let's think about it this way. Okay? Imagine I-95. Okay? Imagine I-95 was brand new, and they didn't have a speed limit sign, and you went around some cones, and you went out there, and there was no speed limit posted. Some of you guys are like, oh, yeah. Whew. Let's go. How fast are you going? 
Come on, Troy, how fast are you going? As fast as it'll go, right? As fast as it'll go, right? Now you go out on 95, and there's a speed limit, 70 miles an hour, and then you get into the Portland section, and it's, it's what, like 50, 55, and people still go 70 plus, right? But anyway, right? 70 miles an hour, the second you go over 70, right? So you hit 71, what happens? You're breaking the law, right? You're breaking the law. There's a law, and if you drive 71, you're guilty. It was the law that actually defined what sin was. Before the law, everything was fair game. It's a yes day, right? Before the law, everything was fair game. Now there's a law that actually defined what sin was. The law gave structure. Without it, chaos. The law gave boundaries, guardrails, and structure. God gave the Old Testament law so people would realize that they're sinners who need a Savior. Eugene Peterson, who uh, paraphrased the Bible in the message, puts Galatians 3.23 like this, until the time when we were mature enough to respond freely in faith to the living God, we were carefully surrounded and protected by the Mosaic law. I love that. Until we reached a point of maturity... Right? Where we could see, where we could see and respond freely in faith to the living God, we were carefully surrounded and protected by the Mosaic Law. It's a great way to summarize it. Question number two Did Jesus come to replace the Old Testament law? Did I even answer number one? I don't think I did. Well, I did, right? To lead us to Jesus. That's why we have the Old Testament law. Okay, got it. Question number two Did Jesus come to replace the Old Testament law? Answer No. He didn't come to replace it. He came to complete it. Okay, Jesus didn't come to, to put the boot to the Old Testament. He came to fulfill it. He came to complete it. It's an easy answer because Jesus addresses it himself in Scripture. Matthew 5.17, John 5.39 and 46. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Jesus answers it himself saying, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. And so Jesus clearly teaches that the Old Testament was about him. Take the Ten Commandments. For instance, take the Ten Commandments, for instance. Some of you know the song, the Ten Commandments, right? We're not going to sing it because I don't sing it. If you, some of you look confused, YouTube. Okay, the first four commandments, right? The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God, right? The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. The last six commandments deal with our relationship with each other, Okay. And so in Matthew 22, Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was. Listen carefully to the answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Think about it. When you love the Lord your God with all of your being, you obey the first four commandments that are about Him that are about Him. And when you love your neighbor as yourself, there's the, there's the last six. Right? So we should never just rip the Old Testament out of our Bibles. There's probably something wrong with that. Okay? Uh, just, just practically. Okay? But we should never just rip the Old Testament out of our Bibles. We should never say the Old Testament's irrelevant. It reminds us of our recognition and need for God. For Jesus. His Son. It is the inspired Word of God. But, when we read the Old Testament, we should always read it through the filter of the coming Jesus because He fulfilled it. The Old Testament says someone's coming. Right? That's what the Old Testament says. The New Testament says someone's come. Revelation, if you want to even get, get even deeper into this, right? Revelation says someone's coming again. Right? So someone's coming, someone has come, and someone's coming again. And, 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 and that, whoo, this is, get a little excited here, 
Right? That is the hope that separates Christianity from any other religion. There's a Savior coming. There is a hope to come for eternal life. Now, that ought to excite somebody in the room. Woo! Woo. How you doing, Dave? All right. Very good. Very good. All right. Question number three. This is a question we ask a lot, even when we don't know we're asking it. How can I be good enough for God? When it comes to the law, how good is good enough? Here's the hard truth. I can't. Reason number 1,937, I need Jesus. I can't. I can't. I must surrender to grace. Now, let's face it. Some people in our world are better than others. Amen? Amen? Some people on your row. Well, let's just keep going. Right? Some people are better than others. But when it comes to God's standard, the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So no matter how much better you think you are than that person, you still need grace. You still fall short. Let's imagine, let's imagine Bill Gates walked into Gorham Middle School and said, I'm going to give a million dollars to anyone who can swim from Portland, Maine to the Dominican Republic. Any takers? Okay, Mason's in. All right, no takers except for one, but hang on, Mason. Okay, he raises it to 100 million. Still no takers, he raises it to a billion. It's too much to resist, so on the appointed day, a hundred swimmers show up to swim from Portland to Dominican. Fifty of them don't make it out of the currents of the Portland Harbor. Okay? Another 30 give up after 10 miles. Another 15 make it to 20 miles. The only remaining swimmers are five Olympic long-distance swimmers. One by one, they drop out and have to be rescued. The final swimmer, an Olympic gold medalist, long-distance swimmer, makes it an astounding 215 miles. She's still got 1,500 miles to go. As she is pulled into the boat, she says with an exhausted voice, I swam further than anyone else. Don't I get any part of the prize money? The response, sorry, the prize was all or nothing. And that's the problem we have when we buy into keeping the law. It's pass-fail only. And God doesn't grade on the curve. We're all guilty, so our only hope is to accept the grace of God. Not live by the law. Because two things. Number one, legalism locks you in a maximum security prison. Paul wrote, before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up into faith, so uh, locked, up in, locked up until faith should be revealed. Galatians 3.23. When I use the word legalism, I'm not talking about the legal community, lawyers and judges. I'm talking about spiritual legalism. Okay? Legalism is the belief that by obeying a set of rules, you can attain or maintain God's approval and acceptance. Jerry Bridges, who's uh, famous in The Navigators, he describes legalism this way. Legalism occurs wherever a sinner attempts to earn God's favor by his or her personal righteousness instead of by Christ's transferred righteousness, fulfilling the law. Legalism demeans the value of Jesus' work of atonement by requiring sinners to perform activities that are man-centered and in essence man-exalting. 
So don't forget, the whole point, again, is to point us back to God. But if we buy into this legalism, and, 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 and I've never been a part of a church or a group of Christians where this hasn't been a battle, where, where, where this picture in our minds of what a Christian should be, and the, and the grace of God in Jesus, compete. Compete. Okay? Uh, uh, and, 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 and so it, it, just, it just happens. Right? But the law reminds us of our need for a Savior. The second point about that is your only escape from the prison of sin is through God's grace activated by faith. Paul wrote Galatians 3.25. Look at the verse we read this morning. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Look at verse 26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. So, when we're in Christ, three things happen. Look at verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So three things, right? Look at what Paul says in verse verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When you are in Christ, you are a favored child of God. We just sang, I think our second song this morning, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, right? It's who you are. And, and you're a favored child of God. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 6.18, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We are in the family of God. So listen to me. That person that you're trying to hold to a standard that you're unwilling to live to by yourself, in and of yourself, that's across the aisle, that's on the other side, maybe goes to the church down the street, right? They're a brother. They're a sister. They're a sister. And guess what? You get to spend eternity with them. You get to spend eternity with them, right? You get to spend eternity with them. I I can't... Mm-hmm. No, let's keep going. Number two. Number two. I got I to gotta move. Not only are they brothers and sisters, but number two, you have full equality with all other believers. Now, the only caveat I would add to this is for Pastor Ian and I and any other uh, ordained minister in the room, because the scripture says we get to be held to a higher standard. Yes! Right? Yes, so fun, okay, right? But, but, but we have full equality with all other believers. Now, this is not, this is not, well, let me just keep going. Let me just read, let me just read the text. Verse 28, right? There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Some theologians have called this verse the Christian Magna Carta, okay, The Bible says there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul probably chose these three categories. Okay, y'all ready? Buckle your seatbelt. This is going to be fun. As an intentional slap in the face to the Jewish teachers. Okay, in Galatia, who were proud of their religion, they were proud of their race, and they were proud of their gender. And every morning, a good Jewish man would pray, God, I thank you that you didn't make me a Gentile, that you didn't make me a slave, or that you didn't make me a woman. And in, our, in every culture and in every lit religion, including Christianity, the human tendency has been to build walls between groups of people. And the message is, don't cross my wall, and I won't cross your wall. Am I right? Okay, Jeannie agrees. Jesus didn't come to build walls. He actually came to tear them down. 
He came to tear down the walls that the world has built to separate people into man-made groups. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 13 through 14, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made the two one and destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Thank you, Jesus. See, Jesus isn't saying that there aren't any differences between people. Yes, we may have different colored skin. Yes, we may have different jobs and positions of leadership. And yes, there are differences between men and women. A few. But in Christ, these differences don't define who we are. The only two categories that really matter in the world is are you in Christ or not? Are you in Christ or not? Nothing else matters. Go back to the point of this whole entire series. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Everything. At the cross, Jesus destroyed all the man-made barriers of hostility. But now, in Christ Jesus... You who are once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So, I want to look at three walls of hostility that Jesus destroyed that I believe are still prevalent in destroying our church. Number one, the cross bridges racial division. That's a good place to say amen. All three of these are a good place to say amen. Okay, in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. The false teachers in Galatia were telling the Gentile Christians that they had to become Jews first before they be could become Christians. And Paul jumps on the scene and says, this is foolish. Jesus died for all. Don't y'all know the song, Jesus loves the little children, red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. Right? Gee, this is why Paul jumps on the scene and he's so, he's so passionate because they're telling them, you have to change the way that you are, the way that God created you to be in order to be anything within the body of Christ. And that is wrong. There is no less than. There's no less than. There's no less than. The cross bridges racial Division. Number two, the cross bridges social division. Quick history lesson for you, real quick. The American Civil War divided a nation as well as families. It also divided the church in America. Okay? Uh, two months after the war ended, members of the St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia were gathered for worship. At the end of the message, the pastor invited the worshipers to approach the altar to receive communion. The great shock, the great shock of the congregation was the first man to walk forward was a stranger, a black man. Outraged, none of the other worshipers left their seats. After a few moments, a dignified white man could be seen walking down the aisle to the communion rail. I miss those little, all, anyway, okay. He knelt beside the man who was first to get up to receive communion. You know his name? His name was Robert E. Lee. And after General Lee came down, the other members of the church moved forward for communion. Robert E. Lee believed that there was, there, there was neither free nor slave, for we are one in Christ Jesus. The cross bridges social division. Not one of you in here, because of your job, your paycheck, the car you drive, the clothes you wear, are more important than any other brother or sister in Christ. And, and, and most importantly, anybody that's not in the family yet. We would do good to remember our need for Jesus. And then lastly, the most juicy one. The cross bridges gender division. In Christ, there is neither male nor female. Now, what you've got to recognize when it comes to Jesus, 
okay, is that before Jesus in Scripture, right, and, and even during Jesus' ministry, okay, even during Jesus' ministry, women were seen as less than, okay? Women were seen as less than. The feeding of the 5,000, right? We know that's not just the feeding of the 5,000 because they didn't count women and children back then, okay? And so it wasn't just women, it was children that were seen as less than, okay? But let's focus on the gender for right now, okay? That, that women were seen as less than. They weren't even counted at things like that. And so studies show that it was like 13, 14,000 people that were really fed by the five loaves and the two fish, okay? And that's incredible. And it even escalates the miracle to be even greater than it was in the beginning. But, but women in, in Scripture, specifically the Old Testament, before the cross, were seen as commodities. They were sold at ages five or six, right? To, to be wed, to, to, to all the things, all of our worst nightmares is what they would be sold to. They were commodities. Jesus comes and turns women from commodities to co-heirs. To co-heirs. Ladies, shout for me. I mean, come on, right? No longer commodity, co-heir in the family of God. Right? Meaning, you don't need your husband to hear from God for you. You don't need your pastor to hear from God for you. You don't need some priest to hear from God for you. You have the same access to the Father and His Son and to the power of the Holy Spirit as anyone else. As anyone else. But that is not the message that was being preached to these Galatians. Then no, there is a hierarchy in this thing that we call Christianity. And men are seen as more important. No, 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 you're a co-heir. That's why it's important when you see post-Jesus, right? Sons and daughters. Beloved sons and daughters of God. He's not just a good, good father to men. He's a good, good father to you. And so Jesus, on the cross, tears down the wall that says women have no access to God. That there is salvation for all. That slaves have no access to God. There's salvation to all. That if you don't look like me and we're not the same color, or you're, you know, you're five foot and I'm six eight, right? Or, or the social divisions, the racial divisions, the, the, the gender divisions, right? He destroys all of the walls. Jesus. Neither slave nor free, Jew nor Greek, male nor female. All have access to me. And then look at the last verse, verse 29. We okay? All right, cool. If you're not, take it up with Paul in heaven. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. If you are in Christ, you are blessed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. Excuse me, Genesis 12, 2 and 3. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing and all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So I have a goal and a question. The goal is this, that we see from this text, talking about the law, talking about Jesus came to fulfill it. Right? That, 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 that the law was the guardian until Christ came. Verse 25, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. My goal, my challenge for you, live a life that glorifies God by living for Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that's what Paul is getting at here at the end of Galatians chapter 3. My challenge to you, and I'm sorry this isn't on the screen. I didn't have time. God gave me this this morning. Live a life that glorifies God. That's the goal. That's why we're here. That's why you exist. That's why I exist. 
to glorify God. Everything that we do, when we go from here, everything that we do, every conversation that we have, how we work at our job, how we, how, how we, how we serve our families, how we, how, how we live as a, as a single person, how we, do, how we do life, the goal, the ultimate goal, the, 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 the only thing that we're living for is to glorify God. We, we do all of those things for the glory of God by living for Jesus. Only. Only. Period. Living for Jesus. Doesn't mean I don't get to enjoy some things that I like to enjoy, right? But I'm, 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 I'm enjoying and living for Jesus. Jesus created us for that. Jesus created us for that. For joy, right? And so I'm enjoying and so as you, as, as you go from here and you enjoy whatever is, is in front of you today with a beautiful day because the sun's glaring off the car right in my eyes, so I know the sun's out, it's going to be a beautiful day, it's warm, right? As you go and enjoy, right, do it for Jesus, living for Jesus, recognizing that the person next to you is a gift from God in Christ Jesus, recognizing that the freedoms you have are a gift from God through Christ Jesus. And if life's beating you down because you're trying to do it all yourself, remember that it's not by your strength. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so my question for you is this. What areas of your life are not centered around Jesus? In what areas of your life are you trying to, to make your name great? What areas of your life are you trying to build walls where Jesus came to tear them down? What areas of your life are you making something major that Jesus came to, to abolish, to tear down and say, no, this is, this is minor. It's about Jesus. It's about me. I believe that in the chaos, in the chaos of no boundaries, everything goes, sign up for as many possible things as you can sign up for, overtime, this, that, running each other ragged, running ourselves ragged, I believe in the chaos, we would do well as Christians to get back to Jesus. What purpose does this serve in my relationship with Jesus? How is this glorifying God? How am I performing at this? Am I performing under my own strength or am I performing by the power of the Holy Spirit? And listen to me, Christian. Not just in 90% of your life, but in every area of your life, would you be willing to evaluate? Is this for God? Or is this for me? Can I pray for you? So God, I, I thank you for your word. That God, I pray, has brought clarity to questions that have stirred in us maybe for years. And God, while, while this feels like a, a heavy message to bring, there's a lot of material to be taught here. There's a lot of things to unpack. God, I pray that each person in this room heard exactly what you needed them to hear and would respond faithfully in the way that you would have them respond. But God, for each of us, may we evaluate and ask ourselves this question. Are we living for you? Is this for you? Or is this for us? 
And by whose power are we trying to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish? The power of your Holy Spirit or ours? And God, I, I, I fear that we have bought into that we are enough, that our strength is enough, and we're not. We are less than. And God, that doesn't mean that you don't see us as important because you sent your Son that we might be complete, that we might be whole, that we might have hope, that we might be your sons and daughters. And so God, I pray for a submission of life this morning to you and each of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.